All right, I've uh, called the Santa Cruz Metro uh, Board of Directors meeting of November 19th to order and ask for a roll call. Director Beeson. Here. Director Colin Terry Johnson. I'm not seeing her. Uh, Director see her. Koenig. Don't see him either. Director Lynn. Here. Manu's in the other room. Oh, okay. We'll bring him over too. Yeah, it made you do an update and then it said you couldn't join as a panelist. So I think people are just having some technical difficulties. Actually, oh, there, there was a message sent out yesterday or the day before that sends you to that room. I was there. And then you had to just, people need to click on the one they got this morning or maybe yesterday, yesterday was the latest one, I guess. Okay. Um, I don't see Bruce McPherson as well. Uh, Director Myers? Donna, Bruce and Manu are in the other room. If Kingston okay. could move them over, that would be great. And Donna Myers is now in the other room. Okay. So there definitely was some confusion with what was sent out. So maybe, like I said, maybe one of the links had it wrong. Well, if you click on the one that came went out with the agenda, that sends you to that other room as opposed yeah. to a separate invite. Yeah, that's probably what it is. It's attendees instead of panelists. Are so you able to see them, Kingston? I'm not sure which room you're talking about. You're talking about the uh, attendees. Uh, let's see. Do you see Director Koenig there? In the attendees. In attendees. attendees. That's where that's where it said you. Oh, okay, I'll promote them right now. Koenig, uh, McPherson, and Myers. I show in the other room. Yes. And Donna, you're holding a place on the roll call. I'm hoping. Either that yeah. Or yeah. Well, I'll, I'll just hold here until Thank we. You. Yeah. Okay, they should have all been promoted. Okay, yes, we see them. Here we go. Everybody was moved out of that other dark room into the light. So yeah. <laughs> well, let's not make it sound too horrible. That's where the public that's where the public is right now. <laughs> well, at least we can see their faces. So okay. All right. So just so we have some continuity, why don't I just start over from the beginning? Okay. Okay. Yes. All right. Director Dutra. Here. Director Kalantari Johnson. Present. Director Koenig. Here. Director Lynn. Here. Director McPherson. Here. Director Myers. Present. Director Northcutt. Here. Director Pegler. Here. Director Peterson. Present. Director Rockin. Here. And ex officio director Henderson. Here. And we have quorum. Thank you. And uh, today's meeting is being broadcast by Community Television of Santa Cruz County, and we thank them. Uh, are there any um, comments from the board? I don't see any hands. All right. Uh, oral and written communications. So we have um, several letters and things that everyone should have. Do we have communication from the labor organization? Yes. No. Okay. Oh, uh, Jordan has his hand raised. All right. Jordan. Hey there, board. Good morning, everyone. I just want to say three quick things. First, I'd like to start off by saying I like the uh, really like the topics that were brought up in the new strategic plan, and I really look forward to seeing those changes being implemented. Uh, second, uh, despite being vaccinated, I still oppose the upcoming vaccine mandate on the grounds that it's inappropriate for an employer to take away an employee's body autonomy. Uh, and third, I'm uh, sad to see Gina's departure and would like to see an improvement on employee retention and internal culture. Um, I'm really happy and really excited to work together with management and the board um, upcoming to improve on these topics. And I'm uh, honored to be a part of the upcoming positive changes. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. Any other communication? Donna, you may not have asked clearly enough for the public to comment yeah. if they have it. And, and uh, I will ask again, are there any other comments for the board? You have uh, three people in the attendees list uh, seeking to speak, Madam Chair. All right, I'm going to uh, 
reopen that. And if it's just, I think here I'm through them. Okay, so we'll start with, oops, wrong. We'll start with Brian. Hi, this is Brian from Trail Now. Can you hear me? We do. Thank you. Thank you all for taking the time. I'll keep it short because obviously there's a lot of written information there uh, that we've responded. And the main focus is um, we want Metro to have a focus on their representatives for the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation focused on Metro. We want them to, you know, vote for Metro. We voting for Metro, focus on more buses, more funds for Metro. Um, you know, let me talk a little bit about the communications because there's some additional emails related, just to level set everybody. So Trail Now has thousands of supporters. Um, we, we issue a newsletter that goes thousands of local supporters. And um, of course we have the supporters on Facebook. Um, but also when we send out a, a communication uh, to Metro, for example, we actually, what we do blind copies to over a hundred core team members. And some of those key, key team members you see there responding. So I just wanted to give you that awareness. Um, again, Trail Now is a big supporter of Metro. You know, um, we are actively um, political action committees. Our, the first time was when Measure B came we actually opposed Measure B initially because uh, they had a significant amount of money for the train. And, and then uh, fortunately, Metro or RTC changed the language and changed it from 24% funding for the train and moved it to the Metro. And so we were really excited about that. We switched to become a supporter of Measure B. And Measure B, as we all know, is, has been phenomenal for our county. And so we're really happy about that kind of um, results. And that's what we're really trying to send the message here to Metro is we want you all to be successful. We're right there with you. And so we're hopeful that you have a selection criteria for Metro representatives on the RTC board that vote for Metro, that support Metro. And again, we're fully behind Metro and appreciate it. We're hoping for more buses, more funding for Metro. So thanks again, everybody, um, for continuing your work on support of Metro. Thank you. Over. Donna, you want to call on the next person? You're muted. All right, I'm muted. Brandon, I sneezed, so I muted. But anyway, Brandon, um, you're next. Good morning, members of the board. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. So we just had two things for our labor communications out of SMART. Um, one, we wanted to reiterate how great it was to join you guys last week up Friday on the uh, activity that we had there that was a really good thing for us overall. Uh, the second is a quick piece on the consent agenda for 9.9 .9 regarding the termination of contract with GMV Synchromatics and award of contract to Clever Devices. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail with it. I'm sure Isaac will have that covered, but I just wanted to let you guys know that our union and our officers are in full support of that movement away from Synchromatics and to Clever. And we're hoping that that will work out much better for us in the future. So I just wanted to put some uh, backing behind that from the union position as well. Thank you for weighing in. Thanks, Brendan. Yep. And also thank you for being there uh, last week on the for the workshop. Appreciate your participation. Absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next, we have um, David. Uh, good morning. Can you hear me all right? Yes, thank you. Hi, uh, you know, I just wanted to say that the new Route 18 is amazing. You know, I live on the west side and literally because of the 18, I've now ridden the bus probably more often since uh, June than any other, you know, time uh, living here. Uh, it runs well into the night. It's often packed. 
know, I've taken it probably two dozen times, which, you know, is, is a lot for a non-student on uh, this side of town. So it's a totally useful route. Um, you know, this kind of frequent efficient service, I think, could really help bring on new writers, people who might not have otherwise really thought about using public transit before. Um, and of course, as you move forward with better real-time tracking and easier payments like uh, Clipper or TAP credit cards, that's going to help too. So really, I just wanted to say thanks and thanks for all you do. It's a great new route. Thanks. I thank you, David. And you know, it's always nice to have someone take the time to come and share positive things because like many of us, we only <laughs> take that time when they're when we're unhappy. So thank you. And are there any I don't see any other hands. Okay. We will go back to just one second. I was looking at something else. Okay, we already asked for labor negotiations, so next would be consideration of a resolution. Uh, uh, number 11, is that? No, uh, number seven. Okay, let me move back a bit. That's what happens when you start multitasking. Oh, yes, okay, Mr. Page. Metro Advisory, uh, uh, written communication from MAC? And there are none. All right. Additional documentation to support existing agenda items. And that would be the staff report for agenda item 9.9 .9 was distributed to the board members yesterday, yes. November 18th, and will be added to the online packet. All right. Thank you. So do we need a motion to approve the consent agenda? For city council, we do. So You should ask first if there are people who like to pull anything yeah. from it. Thank you. Um, and is there anyone who wanted to pull any items from the consent agenda? Don't see any hands. And so, move adoption. Yeah. Have we asked the public if they have anything? I, they... That's what I was asking. I'm sorry, I wasn't clear. I thought you were asked, asked, first asking I, the board. That's all right. Uh, it's good to make it more clear. Uh, so we have a motion by Larry. I'll second that motion. Second by Mike Rodkin. All in favor, roll call, actually, vote. Director Dinkins? Yes. Director Helen Terry Johnson? Yes. Director Koenig? Aye. Director Lynn? Aye. Director McPherson? Aye. Director Myers? Aye. Director Northcutt? Aye. Director Pegler? Aye. Director Peterson? Aye. Director Rockin? Aye. And we have quorum. Thank you. All right, to our agenda item, so number 10, I believe that will be from Chuck Farmer. Hey, everybody. Um, so I'm just gonna talk to this. We don't need to show anything up because I know it's just a uh, presentation. So as we venture down this road of solving our debt issues, hence this pension outstanding balance or UAL in short, um, we need to put in place two policies so that we are structured accordingly. And one of them is the debt pension policy as well as because we are going after the pension right now, we need a pension funding policy. There is actually a third policy that we are not gonna do. It's an investment policy. So to be clear, these two policies have no relation to any type of investments. We are not looking to invest, ask the board to do investments that may be risky or not risky. This has nothing to do with investments. This is strictly around how do we manage our debt as well as as part of our debt putting in a policy on how we manage the pension policy so um just to kind of give you a quick overview of the two different policies so the debt policy itself is really put in place for the board to have authority around whether or not we want to issue debt or not issue debt and that debt could be either bonds lines of credit bank loans etc and there's a very specific law that indicates what type of debt we can issue to, and that's actually written out in the policy. And then, but at the end of the day, the board has approval on whether or not we go out with debt or not. And so that's really 
in a nutshell, what the debt management policy is. And then the pension fund and policy, on the other hand, is really a policy that focuses around our pension, our obligation to um, the long-term cost and benefits provided to our members or people part of the uh, policy. And that kind of covers, you know, CalPERS or whether we go on our own with either a bond or Section 115 and so forth. And then, of course, putting in there a goal that our ideal goal is somewhere between 90 to 110 percent funded, which, of course, 100 percent always. But as investments go, it could go up or down. But our goal is to stay in there. And then at the end is truly the board has uh, ultimate say on um, what we do with any money that goes into the policy and whether or not we want to change the amount of money we have in the policy and so forth. So it's really the due diligence. So those two policies in themselves will help us establish kind of the framework going forward to fully funding our pension um, here coming up in a few months. Okay. Um, does anyone have any questions for Chuck? Thanks for the report. It was very clear and it was an education. Thank you. <laughs> and I and I just want so when you're talking, I mean, um, some of the options you're talking about, whether the board would have final say if we and I'm asking this, uh, were to say invest a trust 115 or we're a pension or just uh, pay. Uh, early payments. I mean, some of those things, are you saying those would be things that would be brought to the board? That's correct. So before we do, we will make a recommendation to the board that we would like to fund the 115 or just right. add payments in. And then the board ultimately will say yes or no. And okay. Thank you. That, as uh, Mike said, very good, clear explanation. Thanks. All right. Thanks. Um, then were there, were there two parts or there both of those parts covering that? So pension policy and debt management. Okay, we will move to consideration of resolution, making certain findings and directing the board. Public, that public comments. We do need right. to make a motion on that. Oh, right. Okay, we'll need a motion to but support it, the- Do you want public comments first policy. before a motion? Yep. Are there anyone from the public wanting to comment on the management or pension policy? And I see no hands. And I will move. I will move the recommendation staff on these two items. I'll second, Myers. Thank you. All right, uh, Director Dutra. Aye. Director Collentary Johnson. Aye. Director Koenig. Aye. Director Lynn. Aye. Director McPherson. Aye. Director Myers. Aye. Director Northcutt. Aye. Director Pegler? Aye. Director Peterson? Aye. And Director Rockin? Aye. And the motion passes. Thank you. All right, next is number 11, the consideration of the resolution making certain findings and directing the board and its committee meetings to be to continue to be held via teleconference. And that's with Alex, our CEO, Alex Clifford. And Alex, you're muted. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, sorry, press the wrong button. Yes, so as we discussed, I believe last month, every month uh, we must pass this resolution in order to continue to do virtual meetings for as long as the governor continues to declare a state of emergency. So this is just a repeat of what you did last month and what you will do in the coming months. Julie, anything to add to that? Nothing to add, unless anyone has questions. Well, I think we're all having to do the same thing in our boards and commissions, and mm -hmm. so thank you. All right, so do we have a motion? Public, to com have public comments. Yeah, I don't know. I'm out of sync <laughs> this morning for whatever reason. <laughs> Long night last night is why. And it was work. It was work. <laughs> Carolyn, um, let me yes. just add, in case you haven't heard, this week, the governor did extend the state of emergency until at least the end of March. So the AB, AB 361 goes hand in hand with the declared state of emergency for the entire state of California. Once that state of emergency is over, 
unless another executive order or other action is issued, we would need to go back to in-person meetings. So right now that state of emergency has been extended through the end of March. <coughs> Thank you, Julie. All right, and do we have a motion to uh, adopt the resolution? I'll move Hello. the resolution. <laughs> I'll second that. Okay, and I think Chevron was our first. Yeah. All right. Okay. <clears throat> okay. And uh, Director Pegler seconded. That was the okay. second, correct. Thank you. All right. Roll call or uh, vote. Roll call vote. Uh, Director Dutra. Aye. Director Colantary Johnson. Aye. Director Koenig. Aye. Director Lynn. Aye. Director McPherson. Aye. Director Myers. Aye. Director Northcutt. Aye. Director Pegler. Aye. Director Peterson. Aye. Director Rockin. Aye. And the motion passes. Thank you. Okay, well next we have uh, Christina will update us on the year to date key performance indicators uh, report for the quarter as of September 30th, 2021. Thank you, Donna. Good morning, board members, public. I think we have a presentation that will make this more interesting. Donna, if we could maybe bring that. It should be item 12.B.1. And that's us. Okay, next page, please. So again, we'll start with our financial performance, and it will be followed by presentations for ridership and risk, reliability, and operations and dependability. With financial performance, we'll go over the system, the system fare box recovery ratio. Next page, please. So as we anticipated, honestly, um, fare box recovery increased to 16% at the end of September, and it's significant increase from prior year as well as from the end of fiscal year 21. Way, it's still below uh, pre-COVID levels. Our average for Q1 pre-COVID was approximately 20%, 22%. We're at around 16 right now. Christina, um, can I interrupt real quick? Of course. Are, are we putting the slideshow up? It is up. We're I seeing think, it. I believe it's up. Oh, I don't see it. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Let me fix the problem at my end. Sorry. Maybe the people that got transferred over from the other thing don't see it. Donna Myers, yeah, can you see it? I got it. I got it. I got it. Problem at my end. Apologies. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. So, um, the fare box recovery that increase primarily is due to an increase in ridership and um, fares while our operating expenses stayed pretty stable. To the extent to which our operating expenses are stable and under control and ridership as well as fares are increasing, we will see an increase in our fare box recovery ratio for the next couple of months. Next slide, please. Essentially the same story for uh, the cost per revenue service hours. Our cost, it's, it's always a kind of a function of two variables, cost and revenue service hours. Our costs are very stable year over year. If anything, actually, we have slight decreases in some areas. Revenue service hours are increasing in Q1. I believe we added approximately 8,000 hours year over year. So of course, that will result in um, a lower revenue service cost, as you can see here. Next slide, please. And essentially the same thing for paratransit with an increased number of uh, trips and stable cost, our um, cost year to date, it's lower, significantly lower than prior years. Do you have any questions about the cost per, per trip or revenue service hour? Okay, if I can ask, it's nowhere else in the report. Um, whether parent, how, how much uh, excess capacity still exists in the paratransit system on which we were basing that uh, experiment or, uh, you know, uh, trial run of uh, uh, on-demand service? On -demand? I don't know if Danielle's on, but very little capacity is left. Paracruise ridership is, is approaching pre-COVID levels. There is capacity on nights and weekends, and so we're thinking of possibly pivoting that uh, pilot 
to focus on those areas of, of the day. Thank you. That's it. Thank you, Jen. Next slide. It's actually ridership. So we will continue with planning. So total ridership per hour has gradually increased uh, each month in the first quarter of FY22. And this is largely due to the return of UCSC and Cabrillo students into our system in September. Uh, we only captured about half a month's worth in uh, September when campus activities really started to ramp up. Uh, but we're still down about 40% overall uh, compared to pre-COVID levels. Next slide, please. Uh, so again, uh, UCSC ridership really shot up uh, in September with the return of students. I think we'll continue to see that uh, in the second quarter, um, but we're still about 40% down over pre-COVID levels. Um, Cabrillo ridership also picked up, um, not quite as much. Ridership is still down about 88% compared to the first quarter of FY20, the last pre-pandemic quarter. Uh, next slide, please. And Highway 17 is more or less uh, remained steady and is down about uh, 30 or 66 percent compared to pre-COVID levels. So we're still not seeing a return on our on that commute-focused route. Next. Uh, and local ridership saw a slight uh, uptick in September. Um, again, we're still around, I think it says 66% there, but I think that's actually the opposite. We're about 45% down compared to pre-COVID. Uh, next slide, please. And productivity. So with the return of UCSC students, our, our west side, UC, UCSD routes are now, again, our most productive routes in the system. I think we'll continue to see that, uh, followed by 69A and W71, our, our major uh, inner city routes connecting Santa Cruz and Watsonville. And just to pause on this slide real quickly, so, you know, every, basically every route here is doing uh, at least better than 30 passengers per revenue hour, except the Watsonville Circulator and 41. That's really the, the upper limit that we could possibly hope to squeeze from our on-demand service. So even though ridership is much less than it was uh, previously, it's still not something that we could serve effectively with an on-demand type service. We, we still need to be focusing on our fixed route service. Okay. Thank you. Next slide, please. And risk management and safety with Curtis. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this slide in, uh, represents basically uh, the KPIs for uh, seven indicators that we've been tracking. And as you can see that now that we start to come out of uh, post-pandemic, that traffic patterns are basically starting to return. And as we start to see the number of incidents uh, start to match uh, pre-pandemic. Um, also, what we continue to, to track is there are basically of the seven, there are five of them that are non-chargeable uh, to the operators. Next slide. This slide also represents, once again, the same thing with uh, the three years of the first quarter, basically passenger incidents. And this is kind of related to slips, trips, and falls. Uh, what we have noticed, once again, for this quarter, it has been 100% non-contributable to the operators. Uh, the, basically, what we're still seeing is uh, incidents where uh, passengers are falling outside the bus or they're intoxicated, or sometimes if there are incidents inside the bus, it's basically with some of the passengers carrying uh, packages and not kind of paying attention to their footing. Uh, we did in the safety department examine uh, with the video footage and observed that the 4200 series buses was one of our largest uh, contributors for some of the incidents. Uh, working with fleet maintenance, we did an inspection of the entire fleet to see what we can basically do to mitigate the hazard. What we did find on the 4200 series was that the stanchion poles did not have any type of indication for watcher step. Basically, once uh, fleet maintenance did uh, modification to add watcher step on the stanchion poles, 
Uh, knock on wood, as of four weeks now, we have had zero incidents and we'll still continue to track and mitigate the hazard. Could you tell which, which of the 4,200 buses in more common parlance are those, are those recent buses or older ones or which ones are those? I don't know the number. No, no, right. those, those are Highway 17. Thank you. Yep, and that what we saw in that uh, director was basically that bus series has a middle step uh, versus uh, most buses have a step up towards the end. And what we're seeing is uh, when people ring the bell to exit, they were looking straight forward and was missing that step. So there was nothing to catch their peripheral view up high. There is a watcher step that is on the ground. So we added a visual enhancement. And as of now, four weeks straight, we have not had any incidents. That's great. Mm -hmm. That's a really good example of proactive dealing with safety. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, next slide. Okay, and so our maintenance manager, Eddie Benson, will present reliability API. Okay, this slide is for our fixed route buses. We've had an increase in our miles and uh, our miles, our main distance travel between uh, failures has uh, reduced. When in uh, July we had 10 uh, chargeable road calls, August we had 18 chargeable road calls, and September we had 12 chargeable road calls. Again, uh, from the last month, uh, which would have been August, we've had an increase in our miles, and we had a reduction in our chargeable road calls uh, between those miles. Uh, next slide. On the Highway 17, basically about the same thing. We've we've uh, we've had three chargeable road calls uh, for the Highway 17, an increase in our miles. On uh, uh, July, we had three road calls, chargeable road calls. August, three chargeable road calls, and we had no chargeable road calls in September. Next slide. Uh, in Pair Cruise. Basically, we've seen an increase in our mileage there as well. Uh, one chargeable road call in July, one chargeable road call in August, and no chargeable road calls in September. Next slide. Thank you, Eddie. Next slide, it's operations and dependability with uh, canceled trips by area and calls. And I believe that will be um, Margill presenting those. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so in July, uh, the majority of our um, cancellations were due to the freeway closure on uh, the 21st. Um, those affected a, a lot of the uh, areas of our service. And um, in August, all the trips fell on the 9th and the 28th. Um, while in September, all canceled trips were on the 18th or the 30th. Um, and they were mainly due to staffing shortages um, the dispatchers do their best to disperse the ca cancellations throughout the um, agency uh, to make sure that one line is not overly affected by the cancellations. Um, it's just sometimes we have um, events or issues that um, come up and the operators are, are um, you know, just basically don't show up for work. Um, we also tried something a little new where we gave a lot of the um, extra board Saturday and Sunday off because we were um, so short of personnel. So that contributed to it as well, uh, hoping that um, we would have enough operators to cover the service on the weekend on overtime and make sure that we were able to cover the UC Santa Cruz service and regular service during the week. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Next slide, please. Again, um, pass ups are the same. Um, as everyone is aware, we were, had reduced capacity. So um, we saw an increase in pass ups. And then um, because we've uh, increased capacity on our buses, uh, we've seen a, a, a decrease on um, our pass ups. More people are able to, to get on the bus and ride it, um, which provides us a decrease in, in uh, pass-ups. Next slide, please. 
Thank you, Margo. And with that, um, that basically concludes our presentation. If you have any questions about KPIs, any other questions? Thank you. Okay, thanks. I was just looking to make sure there's none. Yes. All right, thanks. Okay. Okay, well, thank you for that report. Uh, the What I'm going to do next is move to closed session. So I'll ask, ask, and we'll return for the other items after closed session. I'll ask Julie to um, review the items for closed session. So, so you're changing the order so the CEO's yes. report will happen after closed session? Yes. Thank you. Hi, yes, we just have one item for the closed session, which is a conference with labor negotiator and it will involve met metros, all three unions. And I, I do not anticipate a report out after. Yeah, we won't report out on the closed session, but we will be returning for the CEO report and announcing the next meeting. And any items to be discussed, uh, uh, no, just those two items, so thank you. So we will return after closed session and see everyone, uh, see. Are people closed. allowed to comment on the closed session items or no? Pardon? People are people allowed to comment on closed session items? Sure. Yes. If uh, if there are comments from the public before we move into closed session, you can do that, and we'll also ask for any after. All right. I see no hands raised, so we will go ahead and move to uh, the room for closed session. Do we have a link that's been sent to us today on that? Yes, there should be. Oh, I'm not sure today. Do we have one for today? It, sh it came this morning. From I Ian. thought I saw it. Yeah, it came this morning from Ian Berry. Right. Yeah, it should be labeled in the subject SCMTD closed session invite link. Thank you. Nothing there. Yeah, be sure you find it before you leave so we can ask for some help if needed. Yeah, I, I, I don't see it online. Look, yes. Searching for Ian. Ian, it came. Oh, I found it. Thank Good. you. Right at eight o'clock. Thank you so much. All right. See everybody in a few minutes. Kingston. Kingston. Okay, we're waiting for everyone to return from closed session to open session. And we will start with a report. Julie, would that be the way to do that? Yeah, all we have to say is there's no reportable action. Okay, and then we will can move to uh, CEO oral report and COVID update. Is that yep. correct? That's right. And we can still address the other issues. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair and Directors. Uh, I have a rather lengthy report. A lot has occurred in the last 30 days, so please bear with me. Uh, we were on a good glide path for a short meeting, and I'm going to put that in jeopardy. So I apologize in advance. <clears throat> in the way of new hires and promotions, uh, we have none this month. We'll get caught up with that in January. We expect to have an announcement of several new hires and promotions. Uh, I'm sad to report that uh, since your last meeting, we've had two COVID positive cases. Uh, both were unvaccinated. Both employees came up positive in our on-site uh, twice a week COVID testing program for unvaccinated employees. <clears throat> so our, our program continues to, uh, to identify the COVID positives as quick as possible. We've also, since your last meeting, notified all employees that as a condition of working at Metro, they must fully they must be fully vaccinated by December 31st or face discipline up to and including termination. However, hand in hand with that, we have uh, we we are accepting religious and medical exemption requests. We have received numerous requests 
um, predominantly religious requests, and those are under review. Uh, in addition to that, two employees that are currently unvaccinated have notified Metro that they've started the process towards full vaccination and have received their first vaccination. <clears throat> um, in, the, in addition to, to that, in a way of trying to help our employees um, with that decision, HR has, has now had several on-site vaccinations and today is another on-site vaccination clinic, which will be at Paracruz and at Judy K. Souza Operations. <clears throat> and at, the, uh, at these clinics, employees can receive their first, second vaccination, or their, uh, their booster vaccination. Moving on, to, any questions on any of that before I move on? Okay. <clears throat> Uh, I've talked to you uh, the last couple of months about two federal audits that are occurring on our property relative to a federal requirement that the uh, uh, FTA audit those recipients of COVID relief funds, uh, which we are. Um, one audit has now been completed, and that had that resulted in just some very minor recommendations. So we're really pleased about that. And the second audit is still pending. We believe we've provided them everything that they need. Um, so assuming that that's the case, at some point in the next two or three months, that one will probably let us know how we did. Um, because we love audits, we also had the TDA audit yesterday. Um, that's an annual process. And um, so it's, a, it's called a TDA Triennial Performance Audit. And this is for the period of 2019 through 2021. Um, and then we especially want to thank the leadership team for attending and representing their respective departments and providing important information. Um, we'll get a report at some future date on that, but we feel based on yesterday's meeting, things will be just fine. <clears throat> then we have uh, currently going on RTC has a uh, round of discretionary funds that they are they are soliciting applications or they have solicited applications for. The staff recommendation is gonna go to the December RTC meeting. I bring that to your attention because for those of you who are representing us in particular, Metro on the RTC, uh, we just wanna make you aware that the County Public Works Director has been making rounds to try to have the various committees change the rec staff recommendation. Um, most pointedly, he is trying to have Metro's staff recommended $1 million defunded and moved over to the county for roads and streets and roads. Um, we obviously oppose that. He made a play yesterday at ITAC to do that and failed. We hope he will fail at the RTC meeting. Uh, just in the way of background, <clears throat> the staff recommendation is for one compressed natural gas articulated bus that we would use to replace one of our aging articulated diesel articulated buses. <clears throat> the recommendation is for $1 million, and um, we're supporting that. Uh, I would I would just point out that our request to the RTC during this round of discretionary funding was much more substantial. Um, we had originally requested that we be funded for two compressed natural gas articulated buses to the tune of $1.8 million. And we applied also for $2.3 million for our local match for Paracruz facility. So, you know, we, we applied for over 3 million, over $4 million and staff recommended one. We're not trying to make a play to change that. We're not trying to make a play to get more money for paratransit or articulated buses. We just would like the RTC to approve the RTC staff recommendation for us of the $1 million for the one compressed natural gas articulated bus. Okay, don't see any hands moving on. <clears throat> In the way of uh, the South County Bus Division, which as you probably recall, we've reported that we're looking for money for, for planning. We wanna get that 
we want to get the planning money so that we can get that planned and engineered up to about at least a 30% level so that we can be the so-called shelf ready or shovel ready project and go after construction grant money. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we were notified yesterday that the federal government did not fund our raise grant request. Um, I believe California only got two raise grant awards. <clears throat> so that's unfortunate, but because Wanda Moo, our grants person is very forward thinking and, and creative and innovative, Simultaneously with that grant application, he has filed two other grant applications. Um, one is an FTA 2021 Areas of Persistent Poverty Program, AOPP grant. Um, we're requesting $850,000 through that program. We're committing $150,000 in matching funds um, for a total of a million dollars. And simultaneously, we have a Caltrans Division Transportation Grant request for $1 million. So there's two other grants in place. South County Bus Division is, is not dead. And we're hopeful that one of these other grants will come through. Um, and if they don't, WandaMoo will find another grant for us to go after. Uh, we think it's important and it, it is the way that we will comply with the CARB regulation. Absent a new division, we are going to have a very difficult time, maybe even impossible time. Moving on to PERS UAL unfunded liability. Um, we continue to make progress towards issuing pension obligation bonds next year. <clears throat> to that end, we hired Urban Futures as our financial advisor for the bond. Uh, Urban Futures UFI is the number one pension obligation bond advisor in California, having done more than 3 billion in pension bonds across the state in the last two years. We're currently finalizing the contract for our bond council, which will be Jones Hall. They represented Santa Cruz County for the most recent pension bond obligation offering a few months ago. And the last consultant bond underwriter has gone to RFP and we are scheduling 30 minute Zoom meetings for the week of Thanksgiving. Hopefully we will have the underwriter on board in early December. And if you have any questions on that, I can bring Chuck up. If not, I'll continue on. Okay, so we also have the winter bid coming, which is effective December 9th, and you may have received some complaints. We are receiving some complaints about the canceling of the 5 a.m. First Highway 17 bus out of Pacific Station. Um, we are canceling that um, because primarily because of extremely low ridership, about three or four riders <coughs> on that bus per trip, um, and because we need to just simply trim back the number of assignments that we have out on the street due to our bus operator shortage. Um, so effective December 9th, that first Highway 17 bus over the hill will start at 6 a.m. instead of 5 a.m. Okay, continuing on. We talked a little bit about bus operator recruitment. Our bus operator recruitment um, slash hiring bonus has resulted in I think we had something like 25 applications, and by the time we went through the screening process, we narrowed it down to eight employees that were hired. They'll start their class in mid-December. Um, we ideally wanted a class of 12, so that's unfortunate that we couldn't get 12 out of that group. <clears throat> it just means that when this class graduates, we'll be into another class and probably another class after that. Some real exciting news about our 2016 LONO grant. You will recall we were reported in the past that our partnership with BYD in 2016 failed because BYD couldn't produce an over-the-road coach, electric over-the-road coach that could do what it needed to do on Highway 17. <clears throat> we convinced the FTA to let us keep the money uh, almost indefinitely while the market continued, the, the market or the production of of electric vehicles continued to mature, especially in the over the road realm. Um, Region nine and corporate Washington DC agreed to let us keep the money. Um, after we got our Proteras, which are not over the road coaches on board, Eddie uh, very creatively said, hey, let's try them out on seven thing. Well, he, he did, he made several runs and they actually performed as we wanted electric buses to perform on highway 17. Um, only negative is it's not an over, over the road coach. So we went to FTA region nine. We said, Hey, can we, can we, um, 
program this money and buy three, possibly four of these Proterra 660s and run them on Highway 17. The only deviation from our grant award is that these buses will not be over the road coaches. Region nine administrator said, I'm excited about what you're proposing. I'm gonna to go to Washington and ask them to support it. He did just that. We got our letter of approval and we can now move forward with the purchase of some more Proterra 660s for Highway 17. Now, we're gonna pump the brakes a little bit. <clears throat> we're gonna wait until after January 1 because the human infrastructure bill is still circulating around and being modified and talked about in Washington, DC. And the last time we saw that bill, that bill included Congressman Panetta's 30% tax credit for zero emission buses. So that's, that's an important thing, and we don't want to leave money on the table. So if that stays in the bill, and if the bill ultimately passes, and it ultimately passes with Panetta's uh, tax credit in it, um, that, that credit would become effective for any purchase of buses January 1, 2022 and forward. So we don't want to prematurely order in December, the bill passes, and we just lost $300,000 credit per bus. So we're, we'll wait until after we see that lay of the land develop a little bit more. <clears throat> in the area of marketing and communications, Danielle has arranged for Metro to have our first Toys for Tots stuff a bus, uh, and that will be on December 11th from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. It will be in Watsonville at the Watsonville Target, uh, and the Watsonville Fire Department is going to assist us in that. So that's pretty exciting. Um, she'll be circulating that information with the media, both print and in television media, and hopefully they will also attend that event. <clears throat> also, um, she has uh, uh, completed applying holiday characters to uh, four of our buses in the fleet, and you'll see those buses kind of roaming around the system, including the circulator and Highway 17. Um, they're, they're really cute sort of vinyl applications that are on the windows. So be on a watch for those buses circulating throughout the county. And then of course our winter headways will reflect the new schedules, which begin December 9th. The headways, this headways will focus on recruitment and hiring. In the way of meetings with elected officials. So now that we're, you know, getting to a different place in this pandemic, um, we have been reaching out to various state elected officials to try to get appointments and just bring them up to speed on how we've been managing the business through the pandemic. <clears throat> so in the last month since we last met, um, we had a meeting, virtual meeting with Senator Laird and just yesterday, a uh, virtual meeting with Assemblyman Rebus. So we would like to restart those sort of regular meetings that occur with our state officials and uh, down the road, we will certainly bring uh, board members into those meetings or at least give you the opportunity to participate in those. Right now, we just wanted to get ourselves reestablished because it's been so long since we talked to these folks. And then in the way of the Federal FAST Act reauthorization known as the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, or we'll call it the IIJA, that has been signed by the president. Um, so what does the $1.2 trillion IIJA mean to Metro? <clears throat> well, starting in FY22, an estimated 1 million more in Formula 5307, 5311, which we use for operations. Nationwide transit formula funds increase from 10.2 billion in FY21 to 13.4 billion in FY22. Provided we continue to achieve our current level of STIC, small transit intensive cities, STIC factors, and we have two, we have the Watsonville and the Santa Cruz STIC, um, we'll receive an estimated $2.6 million more in STIC resulting as a direct result from the STIC going from 2% to 3%. And as you know, in the various committees that I belong to, we've been fighting very hard to try to get, with reauthorization, get the STIC increase from two to 3%. About 20,000 additional funds will receive through the 5339A program. Um, those are funds that we use for smaller capital purchases, such as paracruise vehicles, non-revenue vehicles, um, and uh, most immediate and critical non-bus replacement needs. There'll be more discretionary competitive money. Now, we can't assume that we will get this, but the bigger the pot, um, the greater the opportunity to compete for money. 
Nationwide, the 5339B bus and bus facilities grant program goes from 447 million in FY21 to 456 million in FY22. Overall, there's an increase of $808.6 million in FY21 to 2.1 billion in FY22 for the combined three programs, the 5337A, 5339B, and 5339C. Now, just to bring that into perspective, we hope to be awarded 5 million in 5339B bus and bus facilities grant for the construction of the new Paracruz facility. Wanamu has submitted that grant, I believe now about a week and a half ago, and sometime next year, possibly by March, we will hear whether or not we got that grant. And of course, our construction of the Paracruz facility is, is uh, in need of those funds. <clears throat> Nationwide, the 5339C LONO, and we just talked about our 2016 LONO pro grant award, that program increases 5.25 billion over the five-year bill. This is a plus up of the, the 5339C program of 5.2 billion spread out over the five-year bill. Um, and, and that's important to us because we hope to compete next year for a LONO grant that could fund say three to five hydrogen fuel cell buses. So, um, you know, next year, or worst case in 2023, we hope to be able to apply for a grant um, to bring hydrogen fuel cell buses onto our property. And then there, there will be uh, a $1.5 billion allocated annually to the RAISE grant. And as I pointed out, unfortunately, we didn't get a RAISE grant this time around, but there's always that future opportunity. Uh, any questions on that before I move on? Okay. Okay, board members, I, I uh, would like to read a, a letter to you, um, and, and then I will submit this to you in writing. Um, it is with mixed emotions that I announce today my retirement. Um, my last day with Metro will be January 21st. Shortly thereafter, on January 31st, I will assume the position of CEO at San Joaquin Regional Transit District, RTD. I want to thank the Metro Board for providing me the opportunity to lead this agency for the past seven and a half plus years. <clears throat> I'm proud to say that during my tenure with Metro, the agency has accomplished much. And when I say the agency or when I say we um, in the remainder of this letter, what I'm referring to is a combination of the board, the leadership team, and the employees of Santa Cruz Metro. So I just want to talk a little bit about what I feel are important accomplishments that have occurred during the past seven and a half years. <clears throat> we resolved the $6.3 million structural deficit with no layoffs. We completed the problem-ridden Judy K. Souza operations building, uh, and we moved in. We rehabilitated the Watsonville Transit Center. <clears throat> we opened a customer service window at the Watsonville Transit Center. We started the agency's first zero emission bus service on a new circulator route in Watsonville. We completed a new mural and rehabilitated the original mural at the Watsonville Transit Center. And we upgraded the lighting at the Watsonville Transit Center. We installed numerous bus shelters in Watsonville. We've initiated the phase one planning for a zero emission Santa Cruz County Bus Division. We won numerous state and federal capital grants over these years that were mostly used to replace our aging fleet, our fleet that we were operating beyond their useful life. <clears throat> we made significant progress towards a data warehouse. All of our tenant spaces are now finally leased. We launched new Metro branding and um, we now provide much more professional looking headways and informational brochures. We kept our employees safe by keeping our workplace injuries and traffic collisions low. We added or improved surveillance capabilities, both at our metro facilities and on our buses. We kept the agency fiscally solvent and always had clean audits. We created a bus replacement plan and reduced the backlog of buses we were operating beyond their useful life. From 62, when we introduced you to the concept of this problem, to today, that just being a little bit of right around 38 buses. Significant improvement in that area. We added four zero emission buses to the fleet, our first electric buses, and uh, three more will hopefully be here soon that we discussed earlier. <clears throat> we created a transition plan so that we can be 100% zero emission 
compliant with CARB's regulation, uh, and you'll see more of that uh, probably in January or February. We created the agency's first strategic plan and strategic priorities. We created a 10-year state of good repair unfunded capital priority list that we used uh, diligently when we identify new money. We created a board adopted reserves plan, but not only did we create a plan, but we fully funded every bucket in that plan. We created the agency's first transit as asset management plan in compliance with federal regulations. We created a safety department. We had no safety department here when I arrived. We created a marketing and communications department. We had no marketing and communications department when I arrived. We outsourced our legal services. Thank you, Julie, for the fine work that you do. We successfully achieved a commitment from the RTC to provide Metro 16% of Measure D revenues. Um, we are working towards a 2022 federal loan grant to pilot uh, fuel cell buses that we talked about earlier. We achieved shovel ready status and we have submitted our grant application for federal funding for the new Paracruz facility. We hope to learn about that in early 2022. Our facilities across the metro system are in a far better condition than they ever have been. And that because of our aggressive state of good repair program and a philosophy of attention to detail. And this includes new roofs, exterior paint, new landscaping, um, particularly new landscaping at the Watsonville Transit Center, Scotts Valley Transit Center, and here at the Vernon offices. I've represented, I hope this agency well on the CTA, CTAA, CALAC, the Bus Coalition, Zebra, and APTA, mostly in a leadership role. We, during this period of time, we grew uh, our, right, our, our relationships and partnerships with UCSC and Cabrillo College. We completed a major comprehensive operational analysis. We initiated the development of a bus on shoulder program. We initiated the process towards resolving the UAL unfunded liability. We initiated the process towards a new ERP. We reestablished board subcommittees. We created the, we completed the class and comp study and we implemented it. For the first time in seven years, I now have a dream team leadership team in place. I will very much miss them. Uh, their experience, their expertise, their intelligence will provide the board stability during this time of transition. Then the pan pandemic hit in March of 2020, compounded even further by the CZU fires. There was no playbook for this type of a thing. We worked hard to keep our employees safe, and we did. I made an early commitment that I would do my best to avoid layoffs and furloughs, and we were successful. We, impl we implemented creative work schedules, and we reduced employee exposure to the virus. Finally, in solidarity with our frontline employees who had to come to work every day, I too came to work every day, physically came to work every day since March of 2020. The only time off I took was time off for a little bit of vacation here and there. In closing, I'd like to suggest that the board chair establish an ad hoc CEO recruitment committee. If the board and committee wishes, and it's strictly up to you, this is only my suggestion, if the board and committee wishes, I'll be happy to help the committee identify a CEO recruiter who can assist in a nationwide recruitment. I'll be happy to help you um, get things well underway towards replacing me by the time I leave in mid-January. I want to assure you, the board, that I will diligently perform my duties on my last day here as I did on my first day here. I want to thank you for the opportunity to lead this agency for the past seven and a half years. Thank you. Um, Bruce has had his hand up from moment one. So we'll start with Bruce. Yeah, I'm um, deeply uh, saddened that we're losing Alex Clifford uh, as our general manager CEO. Um, he's done a phenomenal job for us for more than seven years. Um, he, uh, you know, the, I can't, I, I can't imagine what we what we could have done better when we were facing that structural deficit and how he just laid out the roadmap to how we can get to success and, and continuance of our ridership and our convenience that we have. Um, I've been able to go to several uh, conferences or uh, visits to Sacramento and Washington, DC. And I can tell you that Alex Clifford has the highest uh, reputation of anybody I know in um, uh, the transit business. Um, 
it's, it's amazing for a relatively small transit district like Santa Cruz to have such a, an established and highly recognized person uh, as Alex Clifford on those, those boards and commissions that he has uh, put forward. We can go through those accomplishments that he has had and uh, ladies and gentlemen, that it's, I, I'll use that word phenomenal again, that we've been able to achieve what we have been able to do uh, because of Alex Clif Clifford's leadership. And uh, he'll be sorely missed. Uh, it's my understanding he did not seek this. They sought him and I think he's had other offers as well. Um, but uh, I'm just very thankful that he was with us for seven and a half years to really sustain the transit system that we have. And we couldn't have done such a good job without the leadership of Alex Clifford. So gonna miss him dearly. I, I really, uh, I applaud uh, San Joaquin for putting out an offer that he couldn't refuse, it seems, I don't know. But uh, it's been a, a delight to work with him and I appreciate his leadership and what he has done for the benefit of Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District. Thank you, Bruce. Jimmy. Thank you. Um, first of all, I don't know who leaves Santa Cruz to go to Stockton, but we will miss you. <laughs> um, get ready for some heat. But, um, you know, I do want to say that I, I came in with Alex basically just a little bit, I think, behind him um, when he first came to Metro and, 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 entering the board at the same time as him with the structural deficit that we had, we were in real, real, in real bad shape. And, um, you know, through your leadership, which a lot of times, you know, some people weren't happy with because of the tough decisions that you have to make as a leader, um, you were able to get us into the strong position we are in today because of that. And, um, you know, I mean, as an advocate for South County, I, you know, I. I appreciate all that you know we've been able to do. You listed some of it. Um, and I've worked with you on almost every single one of those projects. I, I probably all every single project. Um, and um, because I've been here this whole length, this whole time with you, and 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 I appreciate that. I remember when I, you first came in, I was, I felt like you were like, who is this guy? Like, and and you know, I remember going to DC with you and just you know the way you're so organized and. With Gina, you're, I mean, every, you're you're so organized. We look, we were always so well prepared, and that's why we were always so successful in getting, you know, the grants that we got, and um, you know, moving forward with our zero emission fleet, um, the electric buses. Uh, you you've done a lot, and I and I appreciate that. And um, you're leaving this. I'm in, I'm a little bit of a shock. I just was in a little. We just lost our city manager too, so I feel like. You know, I'm getting broken up with twice, and you know, it's kind of like, um, you know, we will we, we will move forward, um, and with your help, we'll we'll be able to make sure that your team has, you know, another, you know, strong leader who can continue to move us forward, and um, you know, continue to build relationships with all parts of this community, all every part of this county, from Watsonville to Capitola, Scotts Valley. Santa Cruz, the unincorporated area, unincorporated area, transportation is extremely important. People depend on it every single day um, to, to move across um, our, our county and over the hill. And um, you helped make sure that we were moving in the right direction. So um, thank you, Alex. I, I appreciate all that you've done. I know this was this is not easy for you. I can, I, I'm, I'm surprised I'm just finding out about this. Um, and I can hear, I can hear in your voice that this was a tough decision and, um, but I wanna say thank you for all that you have done for us. I appreciate you. Mike. <clears throat> Thanks. I, I wanna start by associating myself with the comments, both of uh, Bruce and Jimmy. Um, I don't know if the public fully understands that that long list of accomplishments that Alex read First of all, being totally accurate, maybe even understating what each of those things were, it, it doesn't. I don't know if you get a sense of how difficult it is to achieve all of those things in a period when, basically, in terms of the overall national effort, there's been a reduction in support for public transit. Um, we're still dealing with funding that comes from a gas tax in 1994, and 
the fact that we've been able to get the grants that we got, that Alex's service, not just inside of this agency, but uh, representing us on a variety of uh, industry lobbying groups and uh, his contacts with people in Washington and Sacramento, um, and, and what has made this happen. I, if nothing else, people should understand that the structural deficit that we confronted, I didn't, I didn't know, I, I came on right in the middle of that as well, um, back on the board I'd been on earlier, but it, it, it seemed impossible to fund it. It looked like we were going to lose a third of our service, or, and I think in the end we lost 12.5% or something along in that range. And that's due to Alex's uh, knowledge of this industry and the way to make these things happen in a way that's constructive and that tries to really serve the public. Um, it, there are probably not two people in public service that have a wider difference ideologically than Alex Clifford and myself. I mean, but what, what it shows is that when somebody's as professional as Alex Clifford is, that is not the issue. Uh, if only at the national level, people could understand that these ideological struggles are not the way we should be addressing things, but trying to figure out how to actually make things work. And Alex has demonstrated that that is something that can happen. And so it's been such a pleasure to work with Alex um, on a regular basis. I was board chair during um, one of the years that, uh, that, that he's been with us. And it, it really, he was always so accessible, so focused on this agency. It was hard to get him to take, he mentioned brief vacations where he wasn't here. It was hard to get him to take vacations. He, he, he's definitely a workaholic. And, you know, even on, uh, on this thing, maybe people don't know this, but, you know, when he was out in, I think in Italy or somewhere in Europe, uh, there were little things happening at the district and we get these emails on almost daily basis responding to, to what's going on. And he, he cared about this agency. He made a difference in this agency. and. It would be a real mistake to think that this is just a kind of a formal rehearsal of, you know, positive comments as somebody's leaving you. I, I am so appreciative of what Alex Clifford has done for this agency. We would be in the world of hurt if it were not for him being our, our CEO and, and general manager during this period. So I, I am happy for you, Alex, that you found something that, you know, will work for you personally. But I'm so sad that we're going to be losing your leadership. Um, you, you will have more than large shoes to fill. And um, I, I don't know that they can be filled. We'll, we, will, we will survive, we will do well, we'll make things happen, but it's a huge loss to this uh, to the, uh, the public in Santa Cruz County and to this agency that, that you're leaving us. And uh, I'm quite sad that, that you're going. I would look forward to the next, we gave you a five-year contract. I was hoping we would be renewing that one at the end of five years. So it's gonna be a real struggle to find someone who can uh, even come close to providing us the service that you have. You've been a wonderful director for this agency. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. Kristen. Thank you. I just wanted to take a quick moment. I know we have a, a couple more months with you, so I'll probably have uh, longer comments in our final meeting together. Um, but I just wanted to take a quick moment to thank you for your service to Metro and your leadership in the short time that I've been on the board. Um, I've learned a lot from you, and, and I appreciate that every time I've reached out to ask for uh, an opportunity to speak or, or to better understand something, that you've always been willing to uh, to speak with me and, and to share that information and that knowledge. So again, I'll keep my comments short today, but um, you will be missed, and, and thank you so much for your service. Thank you, Kristen. Shepra. Thank you. Now I'll also keep my comments brief, but I did want to just acknowledge and thank you, Alex, for um, the generosity of your time and experience and wisdom that you provided me as you were onboarding me um, just, you know, maybe eight months ago, not not that long ago. Uh, it's clear to me that that you care about this work and you connect the dots between uh, transportation and community well-being. So in, in my short time, on this board and working with you. I've learned a lot and I really appreciate it. And I also just appreciate um, your partnership with the city. I mean, just, I think it was just this week that we had a meeting um, to problem solve together around some of the challenges that we face in our community. So thank you for the work that you've done. Thank you for the commitment to our community and, and I'll have more to say as well in um, future meetings. Thanks, Alex. Thank you, Shepard. If I don't see other hands, I just want to add, I, I echo everything that's been said. When I came on board um, 2016, 20, first 2017 probably, um, actually, I couldn't imagine how, 
how we were going to replace 62 or three buses at a million apiece and having seen the structural, I mean, we were close to bankruptcy when Alex came aboard and there was real fear of survival of Metro and to have watched in these seven years, these buckets be filled and, and the buses, you know, be replaced and grants that have been obtained. And um, then, I mean, uh, and I think at about that time also, we were facing the 63 buses and Trina came in for Watsonville and brought up unfunded pension liability and serving with her and, and you know, we were both facing it and you jumped right into that and, and addressed it immediately. And, and now hearing today the plans, you know, for addressing that and bonds, everything just so responsive. And the uh, attention you've given to all of our agencies, to us in Scotts Valley, various, um, whenever there's an issue, sometimes you were at home and responded and, and addressed that issue immediately. So um, it's been an honor to work with you. I, we will, you leave very big shoes to fill and I'm heartbroken to have you leave. So, um, you know, I just want you to know how much you are appreciated by our entire community. I hear so many times things that uh, someone has addressed and you just, uh, I know the same for Watsonville, for Santa Cruz, for Capitola, you know, you really have given heart and soul and you will be greatly missed. And we, I look forward to you assisting us in this transition. And I know you'll give your heart and soul through that too. So thank you. Thank you all for the kind words and comments. <laughs> I would just ask, please move on to the agenda before you bring me to tears here. <laughs> You're not alone. <laughs> so, um, okay, I, we do have the next, is, oh, Alta, I missed you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> It's okay. Um, I kept I, looking around. It wasn't intentional. I, I know. I know. I was trying to get to a safe space because I had to drive to my next meeting. But I want to also thank you, Alex, for your leadership. And I want to point out that, um, you know, while you are moving to another place and not retiring all the way, I want to thank you for even taking the time to be an intentional, thoughtful um leader in building a succession plan. I list, I listened to your list of accomplishments for the team and for the department and for the agency. And I think about all of those shoes that other people get to fill and all of that room that we get to grow and all of that space that you have given every employee at Metro for the opportunity to have value in their work and the idea of where they're going. And so I appreciate that even in the time of being a leader for the current, you were thinking about the future and building this path for your uh, for the person who will succeed you um, and, and while building up on the things that were left behind. So thank you. I thank you for your partnership with Cabrillo. That's how I have known you in this role. Um, and as we've established routes and um, built upon, you know, funding sources and those sort of things, I want to thank you for your leadership, your efforts, your dedication to our Cabrillo um, community, as well as providing services to all of our, our locations between, you know, Watsonville all the way through. Um, so thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you, Alta. Thank you, Alta. Okay, did I, as long as I see Mike's hand still up, but I think it's just, I oh, don't know. Right. I'll take it down, okay. sorry. All right, no, 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 just want to make sure I didn't miss anyone else. <laughs> okay. And no public comments. And I was watching for hands in public, so I, and I'll call for that opportunity. I don't see any hands from the public. Okay. So the announcement for the next meeting, it actually lists December 17th. However, we do not expect to meet December 17th. Our next meeting should be January 28th of 2022. And if there are no other comments, then we will move to adjournment. And uh, wishing all of you uh, happy Thanksgiving and, and uh, beautiful holidays. Thank you. Happy, Thank you all. Happy, Happy holidays. Thank you, everyone. Happy holidays. Thanks, Thanks again, Alex. Thank you.